And hello, my fabulous students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I am excited to be with you today. Today, we talk about the Silk Road. We're going to do the ins and outs of the Silk Road. We're going to learn the different phases of the Silk Road and the devastating diseases that, uh, that came about as a result of the trading on the Silk Road. So let's begin. So what is the Silk Road? It's a land-based trade route that connects China to the Mediterranean Sea. Goods, ideas, technologies, and peoples traveled the Silk Roads. This road provided unity and coherence to Eurasia, connecting the two through trade. So the Silk Road has some zenith. Zenith means like the height of its power. So they have phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is when you have the Roman Empire and the Han uh, Dynasty, and they are uh, at their peak. Phase two is during the Abbasid, Byzantine, and Tang uh, dynasties or empires. And that happened around 700 to 900 CE. And then phase three is during the Mongolians, uh, the Mongolians will conquer China, bringing in the Yuan Dynasty around 1200 to 14 CE. And uh, so these are the three major phases. As you can see, they're not all at the same time, and some of them are actually quite spread out from each other. So, silk production in China. Why do we call it the Silk Road? Well, they sold silk on it, but what is silk? Okay, silk is a luxury good traded on the road. Silk became the icon for the network for Eurasia. Silk is estimated to be used in China from about 3000 BCE, but did not become popular to Eurasia until about 300, approximately 300 BCE. Although men were the traders of silk, Chinese women were in charge of silk production. They tended to the mulberry trees on which the silkworms fed. Can't you see this? Beautiful creature right here. Don't you just want to give it a little pet? A little squeeze. Show it some love. When the worms wove cocoons, as you can see in this picture here, women unwound them in extremely hot water to extract the long silk fibers. They then turned these fibers into textiles, also known as clothes. The making of silk was China's long-kept secret, exposing the secret from punished was punishable by death. So if you uh, were a Chinese and you exposed how silk was made to a foreigner, you, uh, you could die. The secret's out! There are two stories to how this occurred. Eventually, the world figured out what the secret was to this uh, silk. So the first story is there, a Chinese princess smuggled out silkworms by hiding them in her turban. Then she got married to a uh, Central Asian ruler, and then the knowledge was out. The second one, which I think has a little more credence, uh, we, uh, we have Christian monks who smuggle out silkworms, hiding them in the hollowness of a bamboo cane. So they throw in a bunch of silkworms into bamboo canes, and then they kind of plug it up, and then they're acting like this is my walking stick, you know, nothing to see here. Whatever the story is, silk production begins in the Byzantine Empire and thus starts weakening China's monopoly. So here are some silk road goods traded. We have the ones in China. Here we have Siberia, Central Asia. India, Middle East, and the Mediterranean. Become familiar with these. The one thing you need to remember on the Silk Road is that they only sold luxury goods. And uh, perhaps we will need to discuss about that in our class the next time we meet. So, also along the Silk Road, we have the spreading of Buddhism. Buddhism spread along the Silk Road because it appealed to the merchants. They like Buddhism's universal approach versus the Brahmin-dominated Hinduism that favored the elite in India. 
Moreover, Ahsoka accelerated the spread by implementing its principles within the Mauryan Empire and encouraging Buddhist missionary travels. In the western parts of Asia, Buddhism was blocked largely by Zoroastrianism. So Buddhism doesn't spread to the western parts of Asia. And the main reason why is because you have this massive um, wall of Zoroastrianism. And, uh, and, and so when Buddhist, Buddhist tries to spread that way, people are like, no, 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 we're Zoroastrians. We don't want this. And people weren't willing to accept it. In Central Asia, Buddhism starts flourishing in, in highly mercantile cities like Merv, Samarkand, uh, Khotan, Dawang. The Sogdian merchants were responsible for bringing Buddhism to China. Buddhism was considered a highly literate religion, thus it progressed slowly among the pastoral people. Because the pastoral people, they live a more simpler life. And sometimes that more simpler life even means not, we're not focusing on the written word. Merchants were Mahayana Buddhists, believing that Buddha was a deity with an emphasis on compassion and um, possibly the attitude of earning merit as opposed to the strict Theravada branch. Evidence of Buddhist diffusion in Samarkand. We have Buddhists beginning to use Zoroastrianism fire, the, the eternal flame or the sacred flame, in their ritual practices. So you kind of see the the um, the synchronism. Okay, Buddhism starts diffusing into the 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 uh, Central Asia. And then we see synchronism, where we see two religions sort of combining into one. Another example we have in northwest of India, we have statues of Buddha are made with him wearing Greek apparel. As a result of, of course, Alexander the Great, when he spread it, Hellenistic, uh, his Hellenism throughout his Hellenistic empire, this is one of the results. So here, as you can see, this is the Buddha, but look at the way he's dressed. This is very much Greek or Hellenistic in style. So again, we have synchronism. We have uh, Buddhism and Greek culture sort of combining to make their own unique, their own unique um, culture slash religion. Another thing we have to be very concerned about in understanding the Silk Road is the uh, diseases that were transferred as a result. With the flow of culture and goods along the Silk Road came diseases. Cities that were isolated prior to the Silk Road were now exposed to diseases that they did not have immunities against. So the Silk Road brought a lot of good. It helped people to kind of trade, but also these cities that were isolated prior to the Silk Road now they're being very much um, introduced to different cultures and diseases and bacteria that can be detrimental and has proven to be detrimental. This led to epidemics that killed both the rich and poor alike. Early example of disease from trading was Athens. Through seaborne trading with Egypt, an infectious disease entered into the city, killing 25% of the people, including their leader, Pericles. This eventually led to their defeat by Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. I want to make this clear, though. The Silk Road was not around when Athens received their devastating disease that killed 25% of their people and ultimately lost the Peloponnesian War. I'm trying to give this to you as an example and as you can see over here in the picture, this is a picture that depicts that devastating scene in Athens. So, disease phase one. Phase one, if you remember on the slide that I showed you phase one, this happens during the Han and the Roman dy uh, dynasty slash empires. So this disease that, that kind of became an epidemic is smallpox and measles 
as it traveled along the road, it started affecting the Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire, eventually leading to their collapse. Disease could have strengthened Buddhism and Christianity. However, because all this suffering that people are going through, they're trying to ask questions, why is this happening? Why is there suffering? Who's going to help me? Is there a God that loves me? Is there a way to get rid of this suffering? All these questions start getting asked when tragedy is happening. So it may have helped Buddhism and Christianity uh, to flourish. The second phase of the disease happened around 534 to 750 CE. Now, this is part of the second phase, which is during the Tang dynasty that's in charge of China. The disease was carried by the black rats from India called the bubonic plague. This disease killed a thousand people per day for 40 days in Constantinople, which that's what the story says, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. It weakened the empire and thus allowed Muslims to eventually conquer the city and expand Muslim influence into the region. And and lastly, we have the third phase. Now, similar to the bubonic plague or anthrax, there was the black plague. And it happened during the 1200s and 1300s CE. This was a devastating plague. It, uh, it showed up on the shores of uh, Sicily, which is near um, Italy, and uh, was introduced through Florence, Italy, and all of Europe was just devastated. We have about half the population being wiped out in the span of about two years, between 1346 and 1348. This made workers in such short supply that it allowed them to start bargaining for better wages and conditions. In Europe, there were, things, there were people called serfs, and they were basically slaves that had to pay taxes. And, uh, and because of this devastating disease, people were still looking for serfs, but serfs were becoming more rare because they were dying. So those who are actually still alive could actually bargain for better wages. Now, China was also infected with a similar disease, death toll, as well as parts of the Islamic world. Despite all the devastation these disease caused, it gave the Europeans advantage over the Native Americans when they discovered the New World. And um, these diseases that plagued Europe would then go on to plague the Americas, which the Europeans already had built immunity to. So that's that. We uh, I think we covered pretty well the Silk Road. Go ahead and... Write that one-page summary, and I look forward to uh, discussing this with you when we meet. All the best. Bye-bye.